entirety of the continental United States is outlined almost perfectly and nothing in the world but commercial flights. 34,000 of them every single day. I have to go back and look at that every now and then because it seems so unbelievable. But it's true, 34,000 a day. That's why when we have a weather disruption and you hear us on ABC or someplace saying, and we disrupted 8,000 flights today, that isn't all of them. That's only part of them. 34,000. Every one of those cockpits has two people in it, minimum, in the front end, sometimes three in the older jets. And we all know that as carbon-based human beings, that's an old Star Trek term. Now, don't throw mud balls at me for those of you who hate Star Trek, but it's a good comparison on a couple of things. And they give us some great phrases. 34,000 times two opportunities, 68,000 opportunities per 24-hour period over our country alone for a human being, a carbon-based human being like us, to make a mistake that is so significant it becomes the last hole in the last slice of Swiss cheese in Jim Reason's model, or let's just say the last link in a causal chain, and a trajectory goes all the way to an accident. 68,000 times a day, that's minimum. That's just minimum. That doesn't take into account maintenance or any of the other actions or air traffic controllers. Now multiply that times 365 and then multiply it times five. You're into the millions. That's the minimum threshold opportunity for disaster. The disaster that gets me out of bed at 4 a.m. or puts me on the air at Good Morning America trying to explain this in the morning as I put my ABC hat on. And yet we went from one month after the crash of American uh, uh, 587 in Queens, New York, a month after 9-11, we went five years and we didn't kill a single solitary passenger in major airline service in the United States. Now is that a pat us on the back and see what good boys we are type of statement? Absolutely not. For the first three years I kept calling our world desk at ABC and saying we don't want to talk about this. We don't want to jinx it. And then in year four and finally in year five I started saying hey we need to talk about this because something profound has happened. You know what those profound things were? Number one was that back in the 80s when we had changed we, we had fired, another Star Trek reference, we'd fired Captain Kirk, the omnipotent, infallible captain who absolutely knew everything, didn't need any advice from anybody. Does this sound familiar in healthcare by any chance? But by firing the surgeon, uh, captain, uh, <laughs> not just a surgeon, not just to pick on the surgeons, but we basically said to the captains, you know what, we're on to you. You're a carbon-based unit. You're a human being. You may try to be perfect, and matter of fact, you may have been perfect for 35 years or 40 years, but that's no guarantee that tomorrow morning you won't walk in and misunderstand something and kill somebody or hurt somebody or at least come close to it. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Our passengers are depending on it. How many of you flew here, by the way? A whole bunch of Aren't you depending on it? Okay, absolutely. And, and so we turned to the co-pilot, and when we had him, the flight engineer, we said, you, Mr. Ms. Co-pilot, Mr. Ms. Flight Engineer, if we have one, your job is to speak up, but Captain, your job is to create a collegial interactive team that is so communicative that no one on this team would ever hesitate for a moment to speak up if they saw, heard, felt, or even intuited that something was wrong. This is totally foreign to the culture of healthcare. It was foreign to our culture of aviation, but we managed to change it. And yet by 89, we were still wandering around this city saying, but you know what, no matter how good we are, no matter how many changes we make, we are still occasionally gonna drop one. Because, you know, it's a complex system and blah. How many times have we heard that? Pat him on the head. Yeah, you don't understand healthcare, Nance. It's a complex system. It's a complex adaptive system. And then about 89, in a major meeting here in Washington, D.C., a whole bunch of people, me included, kind of went, wait a minute, hold it. If we don't aim for zero, what bloody chance do we ever have of getting close? If you don't put your sights on your goal, and believe you can get there. And I'm not trying to play motivational speaker here, but this is really true. If you don't aim for zero, where, what chance do you ever have of getting close? You really don't. And we changed. And that five-year record, and now many years of, of incredible safe operation continues to this day, is a direct result of our having said, you know, we can reach zero. This is vitally important for healthcare. This is vitally important because the cynicism out there 
The cynicism that you encounter, whether you're representing hospitals, where you're daily in the hospital, whether your business folks are supporting this, whatever your role is, the cynicism is that we can't reach that. We're always going to have a cost of doing business, like the boards that Kathleen and I deal with at times, uh, who say, look at what good boys we are. We brought the hand-washing compliance rate up from 69% to 84%. Excuse me, that's an F-. minus. <laughs> What is it about washing your hands that we're having trouble understanding? You know, like what is it about the word no that's confusing you? <laughs> we haven't had the will. Lucian said this, and he's so right. We haven't had the will. Why not? Because of the most dangerous phrase we have in medical practice and in medicine. And it's not just in the US, but especially for us. This is the most dangerous phrase in medicine. Quote, this is the way we've always done it, end quote. Anybody disagree with me? Now, for equal time, I have to tell you there's a most dangerous phrase in aviation, too. It's, quote, watch this, end quote. You don't <laughs> ever want to hear your pilot say that. Here, Frank, hold my coffee, watch this. That's usually, it's usually the last thing you hear on a voice tape before it goes dark. Um, we haven't had the will because we haven't had the understanding. And much of this is a lot simpler than it seems because of one common denominator that we have never really faced before. And, and this is why aviation, even though it is a different order of magnitude of complexity, is exactly the same as medicine, is exactly the same as nuclear power generation, is exactly the same as any corporation, and on and on and on. Why? Because we use the same component, us, people, carbon-based units. And here is the basic reality. We can't be perfect, and we don't believe it. No doctor comes out of the chute with a belief that he or she can be less than perfect. No nurse gets it. Anybody ever heard of a nurse being hired this way? Now, Nurse Jones, we're happy to have you here at Our Lady of Pretty Good Outcomes Memorial. Um, <laughs> we want you to know that we're a kinder, gentler, human factor, savvy organization, and we understand you're going to make mistakes. We know you're going to kill at least three of our patients a year, but that's perfectly all right. The entirety of healthcare is predicated on the assumption that humans can be perfect. And when that assumption breaks down, what it reveals is that we didn't plan for anything else. This is what every aspect of clinical medicine is, an assumption of perfection, an assumption that every doc be in an island unto himself, uh, a, a, an autonomous scientist, in the words of Dave Nash, Dr. David Nash up at uh, Jefferson Medical, an autonomous scientist who's going to get it right every single time. Well, everybody can't get it right every single time, and if doctors practice in a, in a feedback-free environment, which for the most part they do, with the exception of what's been pioneered here with LeapFrog, and what LeapFrog is going to do in the future, and the importance of that kind of reporting, not just for hospitals, but widening that reporting and widening, widening the audience, docs don't even know how to compare themselves because we never gave them the opportunity.